Hello, I'm here with James Mullinger, a uh, comedian and all-around fantastic cheerleader for Atlantic Canada, <laughs> and <laughs> author of a memoir, Brit Happens. Oh, yes. Sir. Welcome, James. Thank you very much, Chris. It's an honor to be here in yeah. the Atlantic Books offices. It's really a beautiful, creative space. I mean, what better than to be surrounded with Atlantic Canadian books? It's yes. the dream in there. And <laughs> we call this our studio. <laughs> Beautiful. This is the studio part. I love That's it. Right. I, I love the fact that you've directly paid tribute to the fact that clearly I stole the concepts that Sean McCann's uh, <laughs> cover shoot had for my own cover. So <laughs> there we go. Hey, two handsome men, wow. proud Atlantic Canadians. <laughs> two, two people that love this place. Yeah. Had to have our pictures taken in front of water and in my case, a ferry boat. <laughs> Um, well, thanks for being here today and making time for me. Um, it's a really entertaining book, lots of fantastic anecdotes, a lot of laugh out loud lines, um, and just ideas and interesting thoughts, um, more philosophical than I expected from a comedian. Interesting, yeah. yeah. Um, so I really enjoyed it. Um, thank you for that book. I'm going to go over a few things that struck me, and I just want to hear you talk about them now that I've read your thoughts. Beautiful. I'm excited. And thank you so much. That really means a lot coming from you. You know, I was a huge, huge fan of your book and, uh, you. you know, was just um, blown away. So uh, it means a lot coming from you. Thank, thank you. Yes. Thank yeah. you. Um, yeah, there was, this is um, a kind of a melded together couple lines from mm -hmm. the same paragraph. Bullies don't realize the damage they're doing. They are idiots. <laughs> I love that line. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> but I wondered, is it really that simple? It's a good question. Um, I suppose in some cases, I guess there are people that are so nasty that they enjoy inflicting pain. And I guess I kind of, I, and it's a very good point because it may, that is quite a sweeping statement I made there. Um, I mean, clearly the world is full of uh, bullies who do enjoy being bullies. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I don't think, for example, that Donald Trump is misunderstood. I think it's just evil. Like, yeah. there's, there's, no, um, there's no nuance there. But I do think that in a lot of cases, and I guess what I'm talking about is from my own experience, that I don't feel like the people who ruined my life as a child, and, and certainly the people that I've uh, experienced in my life that have been particularly vicious, and, mm -hmm. and, and caused me, you know, untold kind of traumas. I, I kind of had to kind of accept later in life that actually I don't think they meant that. And in some cases it stemmed from their own, obviously, insecurities and their own, you know, in some cases problems at home. Not that that makes their behavior uh, forgivable or indeed acceptable, but, um, but it's something that I think has possibly helped me cope with it. Right. Um, but yeah, I, yeah so, but yes, I guess to answer question, I, I, I do think that in a lot of cases people don't realize what they're doing. Yeah, I think that's very true. Um, and I, I really um, saw in reading the book, um, maybe I'm reading between the lines, but it felt like humor for you was a coping mechanism for that, the tough being bullied in childhood, and then just something that you used to um, connect with people uh, mm -hmm. as an adult and, and develop healthy relationships. Yes, that's a really, really beautiful way of putting it, and I, I, I definitely think so. I mean, I know certainly it, growing up, the thing that I was never happier than when I was with my f whole family laughing. Like if, if we were sitting around watching a, a John Candy movie and I'm watching my my mum and my dad and, and myself and my brother all in hysterics mm. laughing. I mean, I mean, A, there's nothing more beautiful than that connection anyway when a group of people are laughing together. But when it's also four people which are all extremely different, this is, I mean, this is, the, I guess, a part of the crucial point is that uh, the four of us are all extremely different. Me and my brother are very different. We, we really don't have much in common and, we, and, and we're great friends and we love each other. But, but we're not, you know, he's into very different, he has very different interests to, to me. Mm. And my parents are very different from each other. So, but the fact that we could all bond, the one thing we all bonded over was, for example, John Candy movies and mm -hmm. we could sit there laughing. And it, so it was definitely something which, and I think that's why I became so fascinated with the art of stand-up as a child. But also the fact that when I would read about comedians, and I would read their autobiographies, which became an obsession as a teenager. They seemed, I couldn't, I couldn't reconcile in my brain how it was that they were the exact same kind of oddballs that I was and riddled with insecurities and anxieties, yeah. but did this incredible job. And that, that, mm -hmm. that, I think, is what made me so fascinated with it. Yeah. Um, you talk a lot in the book also about the hustle of comedy. Um, you talked about, um, you know, being a sucker for punishment, <laughs> but also, and you endured a lot of painful gigs and experiences, <laughs> but also that you, not only didn't you quit, you are, you must have a God-given gift for sales, um, and uh, you talked about 
you know, pumping hands and kissing babies and being like a politician on the campaign trail yeah. and filling stadiums as a result. Can you talk a bit about that side of yourself and that, I, I mean, I call you a good salesman, obviously, oh, but uh, you know your ability to get out there and fill, put bums in seats, as as they say. I mean, I mean, I, and I guess part of it is is that I, I definitely tried to adopt a, a maritime hustle, which is you know the, the thing that I feel like almost anyone has to have to be su mm. successful here, or indeed to have a career here. You know, when I look at someone, anyone from. You know, I mean, Luke Boyd is being a perfect example, you know, to, to become a, a, a hugely successful rapper based out of Enfield, Nova Scotia, in a town mm, with a population yeah. of 5,000 people, he had to do it all himself. And I think one of the things I learned doing fringe festivals in the UK, where you arrive in a place and you're doing the fringe for two weeks or a month, and you're responsible for getting bums on seats every night, mm -hmm. and you spend all day flyering and all day hustling. Uh, I realized quite quickly that if I was going to move to a place without a, a built-in comedy industry per se, that I was going to have to make my entire life a right. fringe, yeah. and um, and so I, I I mean I guess so in some ways it is kind of you know um, about hustle and marketing, but but it's also just that thing of treating it like any other business. You know, a, a plumber arrives in a town, and they don't know anyone. They they start just doing jobs, and people will talk. Yeah. Um, but also, I mean, I also can't take credit for a lot of the things like the stadium setups and things like that because that was literally down to people getting behind it which again is a uniquely Atlantic Canadian thing that you know crazy Englishman arrives in town uh, they have says you know hi I'm a comedian and everyone says okay well, well we'll give you a go and if they like it they tell people but but then when I suddenly say I'm gonna start trying to play these big rooms if it wasn't for the fact that local business people and and just local organizations want wanting to support and get behind it mm. um, I wouldn't have been able to do it, and and that doesn't happen elsewhere in the world. Like you know, a Canadian comedian doesn't arrive in London and say I want to fill a fill right. an arena, and everyone goes, okay, what can we do to help? It, that only happens in the Maritimes. Well, we're hungry for the new too, right? Like, yeah, you're the new kid in town. So, well, well there is that, and it's I, I think it's also just, yeah, an innate um, kindness that's here, and um, mm. and I, I just think people are always trying to support each other. I, I see it whether someone's kind of new in town or or been here for a very long time, when someone says that they want to try and pull off something or do something uh, people w want to help and actually that goes right down to you know when when we were lucky enough to have you know Syrians arriving uh, in Atlantic Canada seeing the outpouring of you know support and kindness and now of course people wanting to open up their home uh, for Ukrainians coming here it's a, it's a it's a very Atlantic Canadian thing that I think is just built into the mindset here which all stems from this kind of sense of community that you have and and it's sense of community in England tends to mean uh, a narrow vision of, of protecting one's, uh, whereas what community seems to mean to you here, and again, it's not my, my place to say, I'm still only here eight years, I'm still a come from away, <laughs> but, but to me, the sense of community is anyone that finds themselves here. Yeah. And it's an incredibly inclusive uh, concept, I think, mm -hmm. here, which again, I think is unique to this place. It's, it's great to hear you talk um, about Atlantic Canada, just because, um, although, you are Atlantic Canadian at this point, but you still have somewhat, of having grown up in England, a, a fresh perspective on it. And you see things that other people take for granted or don't notice anymore. Right. Um, and you talk in the book, there was two things that struck me as being connected, even though they were separate chapters. One was a series of spots sitting in a canoe uh, with tourists yeah. and them talking about it and how you were struck with what they saw, similar to what I'm talking about now. Yeah. But then you doing that with this magazine, Edit Magazine, and showing how interesting um, and the good things and the positive things about this place and the people here, mm -hmm. but that we kind of forget about or take for granted. Um, can you talk a bit about that kind of, I, I called you a cheerleader, but in a, in a positive way. Yes, that's a, no, you know, it's a, it's a something you do. Yeah, yeah well, I, and I love that. And I, mean, I think that celebratory nature I've, is something I've got, I got from my, my, my parents growing up, like they are, uh, they are the kind of people who, when they have a good experience, I, mean, I, I give an example of, of, of what I've come from as to why I want to celebrate wonderful things. I mean, uh, I have a newspaper clipping uh, on the wall of my office, and it's a picture of my mum uh, by a garbage truck with, uh, with eight uh, garbage truck um, drivers and, and, and bag loaders mm. uh, holding her. Mm. And, and, and I, it's about 1980s, so I'm about two years old. And basically, the the garbage truck men um, knew that she had just had a baby, so uh, made sure that they were really quiet when they came past oh. our house. So my mum uh, wrote this long letter to the local newspaper, the Maiden Advertiser, to <laughs> say 
how amazing our local garbage men were. Mm. And uh, of course, I'm using a Canadian vernacular, bin men, for anyone <laughs> watching in England. Uh, bin men, and, and, and you know, they collect, collect the bins in England, that's yeah. it. And, um, and so uh, the newspaper then, she wrote this long letter because she, she's an innate celebrator of the good and the great. And so it was, of course, printed, but then the, the newspaper sent the garbage men round and a photographer. So I have this picture of my mum, and to me it just sums up what I grew up with, which is, um, when something's amazing, you talk about it. Yeah. So to my mind, it's that when I came here, I couldn't understand a why. I couldn't understand why there wasn't something which kind of celebrated everything that was happening. I also wanted to convey to the rest of the country because I couldn't understand it when I went on tour or went to visit friends living in yeah. other parts of Canada. They would question why we lived here, and I'm like, how? Can so I really just wanted to have a thing where I could go. This is why we live here. Right. And and um, and it's funny. We we're just about to. We've just putting the finishing touches to our fifth anniversary issue. So, I mean, I don't know. Oh, thank you so much. And you know what it's like. I mean, it's, it, yeah. it's not easy being in, in print publishing I mean, at any time or mm -hmm. indeed in any place. Yeah. And, uh, and to do it in a place like Atlantic Canada in 2022 isn't the easiest thing. So to be still going forward, and also, I guess, crucially, the point I'm trying to make is how much we still love it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and similarly with, with comedy touring, it's, it's um, I love exploring this place and it's why, um, my dream is to perform in every single town and city in Atlantic Canada, no matter how small. Like, I, nothing I relish more than doing a, t a show in a church in Florenceville, Bristol. That, you know, those are the, the gigs that I live for. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of the, the comedy and uh, about the region, mm -hmm. um, there was an I want to get the wording right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one, of now. My, one of my favorite lines in the book, but it wasn't yours. It was one you got on the website when you did the, is New Brunswick the ugliest province? Debate yes. on the debaters Amazing, on CBC, yeah. and you got the comment. Fuck you! How dare you! We are friendly. <laughs> yeah. It's an amazing thing. If anyone wants to see the list of comments under this, um, so yes, the, um, it was an episode of the debaters, and the, the 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 debate was: Is New Brunswick the ugliest province? Yeah. I was thankfully uh, <laughs> it, um, against that motion. Um, Peter Anthony from uh, Picto, Nova Scotia, was living in Toronto <laughs> at the time. Uh, was an app. He's a, uh, one of the best joke writers in the country. Uh, the, Delivered an absolute masterclass in. Yeah. He went, came out guns are blazing. He's in St John, New Brunswick. Um, he was so good, he almost convinced the audience that it was the ugly. <laughs> I mean, he was so funny, and it was very hard. But, and it, I really, I really suddenly, I, I felt, I felt like I actually didn't do the job as well as I could because I thought. I had such an easy job defending New Brunswick in New Brunswick. Mm. I, I should have been, I should have been funnier. Yeah. But, um, but, but, but anyway, to, to 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 your point, when it was posted on CBC, of course, one of the things that ha always happens with the debaters is CBC gets so many complaints from people who misunderstand these debates. They <laughs> they don't realise that it's not real. It's funny. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's supposed to be a comedy show, and Steve Patterson says every time they do anything, people go, "Why is this even being debated?" So yeah. sure enough, is New Brunswick the ugliest province? When I shared it, the comments on my Facebook page, and please do feel free to go and have a look at these comments. Uh, <laughs> But yes, you know, someone said like, "F you! How dare you! We are friendly." Yeah. And, and then, and then someone else said, "How would you like it if, if we came and dumped on your city?" And and it was, and what was hilarious was that I would like to, you know, I, I would never blow my own trumpet about anything. But one thing I do think that I have possibly done in my short time here is I think I've made it quite clear that I really do quite like this place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So to then suddenly become the biggest target of hate, right. um, because people people don't click on the link, they don't read the article, yeah. they, they don't, um, but yeah, so that was really quite fascinating to become a target of hate, which we all know people that have ended up being shamed or you know, uh, a, 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 someone's attempted a cancelling on or anything else, right. but it's so weird when, it's, when they're attempting it uh, for something that you literally do the opposite of. Right. Which to me sums up the whole um, absurdity of uh, Canada. Yeah. Of, uh, um, and I think you say at one point in the book you're not really thick-skinned, but I mean, again, maybe it's a sucker for punishment. You, you, like the Chumbawamba said, you get knocked down and you get up again, right? And that's a good point. And that's, it's funny you bring that up because it's one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot and, and certainly one of the things that I feel very... Um, paranoid about including mm -hmm. a lot of that stuff about yeah. you know kind of having you know admitting that, that at times when people have been and, and have been critical of me that it hurt and I kind of because the what we're told to say we're told to say that it doesn't bother me and you mm -hmm. know I don't care what people say um, but I always find it quite disingenuous when you know, I hear people and in a lot of cases it's very high profile people very successful people people like Ricky Gervais seem to talk so much about how it doesn't bother them that you think, well, 
why do you devote 90% of your time to talk about right. uh, how it doesn't bother you? Because clearly it does. And I just thought, I don't want anything in the book to be disingenuous, to not be true. Um, and so I guess to your point, I, I, I can, I can um, there's certain things I can take. I can take bad gigs. That, 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 that you know, I, it, it upsets me because I take the job very seriously and want them to go well. But, but, and, and it does crush me. But I guess the things that, that have, the things that hurt me were when people would be needlessly abusive online for seemingly no reason. Mm -hmm. That that was the thing, which I guess, and I and I don't want to be a forty four year old man using the phrase, you know, saying that it's it's bullying or anything else. But but it's that thing where it's basically not it's not criticism and it's not um, it's not dislike. It's like you don't have to like what someone does. Yeah. You, you can come to a show and not enjoy it. You can you can bring me up stage, you can heckle me because in those environments I can handle it. But I, I, I never understand it when some, someone tags you in a post. And it's uh, saying that they, you know, that they wish you and your family would move back to England, you know, and things like that. It's um, it kind of goes back to uh, was it what was the name? You, you quoted a philosopher, Spinoza, maybe yes, early that's right, in the but book. Yes, that's and right. And that things like that say more about the person saying it than the person being bad mouthed. Well, that's it, right? And, and that's exactly it. Like if someone does take the time and energy to sit down and not only be rude about someone else that they don't know, and let's not forget they're not being rude about someone actually says they're being rude about a, a comedian that's just grinding on the bottom rung of the ladder right. like it's, it seems to me so kind of pointless and it's, uh, to your point and, and to Spinoza's point um, yeah what does that say about a person who has bothered to go on and let's not forget they've also tagged me in it so mm -hmm. they, they want yeah. me to see it someone has sat at home and gone uh, that comedian who's trying his best I'm going to make sure he knows that I think he is rubbish. Yeah. You know, uh, it's, um, but, but yeah, so I guess, I guess it's the pointlessness of it that, I, and I think it probably bothers me a lot less, but it was certainly about a, t a, t a, a time in my life yeah. when I had literally moved to a new place, uh, didn't know anyone, was trying to have a, go, have a go, and then suddenly there were people, and in some cases other comedians, being just being rude. Yeah. And, and I, I, I was genuinely just... Um, perplexed by it and confused by it. Yeah. Um, especially because, like I said, it wasn't like, I'd seen it happen to friends in England when they became actually successful. Whereas I was you know, working for, you know, chicken wings and peanuts and, <laughs> and a pitcher of beer and, and, yeah. and getting the same amount of abuse that, right. um, so, so it, I think it was, com uh, yeah, it was kind of confounding, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, social media is very confounding. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> and you, you talk a bit in the book about the pros and cons, I guess you've also used it to your advantage, you've gotten more, and I've, I've seen some of your fun TikTok pieces lately, <laughs> and um, you know, you're know you using it to kind of um, build your platform more as well, so That's it's a it. bit of a double-edged sword. Eh? T totally, yeah, and I definitely don't blame, uh, I'm not someone that, I guess with social media, it's, it, it's kind of like anything in life, it's all about moderation and how we, mm -hmm. how we consume it, how we use it, it's very easy, like it is with all kinds of things that we enjoy, like wine is very easy to get hooked on because you know um so similarly it, it's easy for people to get hooked on social media and you're right i mean social media has been an amazing thing for me in terms of you know um publicizing shows spreading the word about things and so i definitely would never complain about the the medium although it does have negative effects on 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 people as all things hmm. as, as many things do in life yeah um but but i mean i guess for the most part the one thing that i you know I touch upon that stuff in the book, but it, but equally, it's so small in the grand scheme of things, and and you know what I hope comes across in the book. I think those things stand out because I have never talked about them before. Right. Whereas I hope that what comes across when people read it overall is just the overwhelming gratitude that I have yes. for uh, the the support. And 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 by the support, I mean I, I mean you know the, the my biggest dream as a as a child, and indeed when I started in comedy, was just to be able to uh, do shows and people to come. And then I mean the the it's, it's, it's quite often, it's funny because people often say to me, what's your, what's your dream? And I'm like, well, this was it. And they're like, yeah. well, what's next? As if it's unambitious to say nothing, but the dream uh, that I think is hugely ambitious is mm -hmm. just to sustain this. Yeah. Like, to be a, like to be able to feed a family yeah. as a stand-up comedian living in a small town in New Brunswick, that's a ridiculous, to me that's as absurd as saying I want to be bigger than Adam Sandler. Like that to me, right. you know, and so to, to, so to have actually, um, uh, achieve that or to or to be able to do the job I love in the places that I love and feed a family at the same time N number one dream so the dream is the, the five-year plan and the 10-year plan and the 20 years plan is is somehow sustain that because right. that is very hard to do yeah because you know people you know there's a million reasons why people might stop coming to see you 
um, um, which is why I write so much new material all the time and constantly turning over new stuff so people never see the same show twice. Yeah. But yeah, that's the, the, the dream is uh, you know, tr try and maintain this. And, it, and in 25 years, if I can still fill a, a church on a Saturday night in Bronzeville, Bristol for people to laugh at my jokes, then I've, yeah. I've won at life. So, and you were winning at life for sure <laughs> until COVID interfered with it, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. as it did with so many people. But um, you happen to have a show, and again, I want to get this right. Um, I think it was called Embrace Where You Live. <laughs> yes, Embrace Where You Live, the tour that was written in 2019. Mm -hmm. Yes. Em worst name ever. And then COVID came and forced us. <laughs> forced us to embrace <laughs> to where embrace we live. It. It was, and it, you talked about um, how could I love my family so much and hate them at the same time, yes. basically. <laughs> yeah. Which we, I'm sure we could all relate to during that time. And well, that's it. It was the weirdest thing. And I remember the weekend before on that Embrace Where You Live tour, I was in Vancouver. And I remember feeling homesick and thinking, oh, what I would do for a bit more quality time at home with the wife and kids. And now I can safely say I will never have that thought ever again. And yeah. it was just the, 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 the weirdest thing. Like, with, with a week's note, I mean, for all of us, the, the, the world uh, stopped and changed. And I guess... I mean, the best thing I can say is, is that, I mean, I had started writing the book prior to the pandemic, but it probably wouldn't be finished and out now were it mm -hmm. not for that. And there's a million other positives. And of course, I mean, there's a million negatives to the pandemic. I mean, very few of them professional, all kind of personal and, um, you know, I mean, genuine tragedies, of course, which must never be ignored. But I also think that we should never, uh, we shouldn't be afraid to admit when we have got good things out of mm -hmm. this this yeah. this collective trauma that we've all been through, and I would say both um, personally and and definitely in terms of what I've been able to do in that time. And again, I mean the virtual gig, um, the invention of the virtual gig yeah. has become something which is continuing, not as a compromise or a replacement for in person, but as a separate option. Yeah. Uh, which and I, I it's weird. People, I was terrified of them at the beginning. Now I love them. Yeah, so, and you certainly had some interesting moments. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sharing a stage uh, at a drive, drive, drive in with yeah. a with a cat. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And with your cat, and then a raccoon uh, jumps on the stage, and I've had my children. And then your son streaking, streaking behind me. At uh, and last night I was actually doing one uh, for an Atlantic Canadian uh, children's education group and uh, 8, 8 p.m. show and going on a bit and then uh, one of my sons came down holding the dog and it's like come on in <laughs> and, and, it, and, it, and you can see that I, and I keep obviously have all the videos on so I can see the audience and they're all there and it's just yeah. really interesting watching everyone going oh that's so cute and <laughs> I am um, yeah and, it, and I, I think the, the thing with the virtual thing is it's just a different way of um, of performing but it's it, again it's a great level up because so many people on these virtual gigs say to me afterwards that they don't normally get to go to work events, either because they don't like going out or because yeah. they're shy or they look after someone at home, it could be financial, um, and they get to sit at home and watch. And of course, you can do them for anyone in the world. I mean, I did one last week for RBC Manitoba. You know, I don't think I, um, for every bank teller in the region, and they, they were not going to fly me over and give them all the day off and put them up in a conference room to see a show, but they are going to do a virtual. So, right. um, so th those are the things which collect me. And again, I mean, the magazine had its best year. In 2020, uh, mainly, I think, because a lot of people started within the region, uh, basically thanks to the Atlantic bubble, where a lot of um, organizations, especially tourism organizations, which used to market, for example, parts of this region to uh, Quebec and Ontario, suddenly mm -hmm. were marketing within the region. Right. Um, so it was all those little things which um, I just try and cling on to as, as positives. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and probably the biggest positive is um, the book. And you talked about how it was one of the m more rewarding creative experiences of your life, and you're you're already excited to write another one. Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, there's so many there's so many things that I missed out. There's so many, actually, in the process of just the of the conversations with uh, with Gustav, the publisher, who are amazing, and, and James Langer, the editor, who was again absolutely incredible to work with. In the mm -hmm. conversations post. Uh, other stories keep popping up, and when I so I felt so I've already kind of started kind of coming up with uh, stories and anecdotes that could work. So I guess I'm, I'm right now I'm just <laughs> praying that enough people uh, enjoy this that I get to do another one because yeah. there are some stories that I'm like, how did I forget to? I mean, like I went to a rave with my dad. My dad went to see a, a, a movie about rave culture <laughs> when I was in my early twenties and said, I understand now what. And he said, as he said, it reminds me of 
the 60s, he said, I want to go to, I took my dad to a rave. <laughs> How did I forget to put that in the book? <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, uh, part two. If, if any publishers are watching this and want uh, a book with a story where someone takes their, their 50 year old uh, bank manager dad to a rave, I'm your man. <laughs> yeah, that's a great story. <laughs> um, and it, it, I, I'm sure that you'll get taken up on that because it's a very entertaining book. Brit Happens or Living the Canadian Dream by James Mollinger. James, thanks for coming in today. Not at all. Thank you so more about much. it. No, I really appreciate it. I appreciate everything you do. And everyone watching must also get down to your nearest <laughs> bookstore immediately and get this is one of the first copies, I believe. Yes. And it was today. Uh, Brand new. Off I'm, the presses. Hot off the press. <laughs> it's, it's red hot and I'm loving it. So uh, make sure you get your copy. Uh, order it online, subscribe, or find it at a bookstore near you. And it has an excerpt of this in there. Excellent, <laughs> excellent. Thank you.